My name is Lawrence Wells, and I'm from Unamagi here in, in Cape Breton. And uh, we're in uh, Member Two First Nation. And I was uh, was born here. I was brought up here. And, uh, and like I was telling Lisa, I was uh, I'm a nomad, and I I traveled around when I was younger. And uh, but basically, I came uh, I came back. Uh, I've worked in uh, several areas of Cape Breton here, and uh, up here in Cape Breton. Uh, um, right now, I'm uh, uh, doing um, addiction work for the last 15 years with Native Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counseling, and going on another, I don't know, 13, 14 years with Member Two of the same thing, but with the culture component. And I have a buddy there, that's the Western part, so both of us are. Western and uh, cultural, so, so that's what we do here. I also I'm an elder in resident at CBU once a week. Um, uh, I used to go there twice a week, but it's just too hard. We need we need more of a social work uh, here in uh, Member Two. I was first introduced at uh, Red Rose Project uh, going back a few years, about six six or seven years ago. Uh, uh, Laurie Ann Sylvester, the principal of the school here, and uh, my role was to educate and uh, our our future youth. And um, you know, I was what I was doing was uh, being part of the circle with the kids. I would do uh, talking circles, storytelling, and uh, go on the field trips. How to put up the TP the proper way. And uh, putting up the teepee, I would tell us uh, what the teepee is about. Because, uh, you know, our teepee represents grandmother's skirt. And, you know, grandmother's skirt will protect you f even from your own parents. And she'll spoil you, right? And, and uh, depending on the size of the teepee and the uh, number of poles, you know, uh, there's a story in everything that, that you do when you, when you construct the teepee. Each pole has a story. Each one has a direction, you know, and a virtue. And the way the RTP is uh, situated, I always face the east. And you know, that's where the sun rises in the east. And, of course, it gives light and warmth to Mother Earth. And, of course, in the direction of the east, it has many stories, too. Like, we have Bugwes in the east, which is, uh, I don't know, called... Uh, Maybe Bigfoot because if it teaches honesty. We have the turtle in the same direction as one of the oldest of our ancestors. And that's, uh, uh, has teachings of the truth, and of course the golden eagle has teachings of love, in, in that direction. And you know, and of course, in the direction of the south, we have the brown bear has teachings of courage, and uh, the buffalo has teachings of respect. Of course, the wolf has teachings of humility, and of course, in the West, we have uh, teachings of uh, courage by the black bear, and uh, and uh, the bald eagle has teachings of love, and of course, in the North, we have teachings of uh, uh, the white beaver, uh, Gobit, and has teachings of wisdom. So then we have seven sacred teachings there, and they all belong in the teepee, and that was my role with uh, with the kids. And also doing talking circles, you know, we have, uh, we might have uh, our directions in the teepee and maybe we have a sacred fire. And when we have it, the kids together, usually four days, three or four days, we'll make a sacred fire. And that's another teaching from tobacco and how to make the fire because uh, I'm a fire keeper also. So I've been, uh, my teachers come from Mi'kmaq. Mohawk Ojibwe. So all these teachings that I've got over the years come from a mixture, but, but they're basically all the same, you know. And um, so I'm a fire keeper. I'm also a lodge keeper. So I've uh, I've earned that role way back when when our when our future youth were um, had ideations way back when, and we got together with uh, uh, their Squadej. Squadej are Mohawks, and they're our former enemies in history. Meet Mom, and uh, that goes back, but that's another story. But in time, when 
we know that uh, our future youth were in trouble. We had to get our bundles together and our medicines and work together to save our youth. And I think the first program we did was called Voices of Tomorrow. And we had some people come in here and uh, help us with teachings and get our bundles back and earn, earn our pipes and rattles and, and so on. And um, so uh, we had to deal with some of our uh, some programs out in El Zibuktu, and we had uh, sweat lodge ceremonies, we had feasting, we had naming ceremonies, and uh, talking circles, storytelling, and so on. And uh, this here helps our, uh, we're helping our youth, you know. We still do that today, you know. We, we still run sweat lodges. And back, way back when, but it was, there wasn't too much of it maybe in the other reserves, like the sweat lodges. So in order to earn the sweat lodge, you have to take a, a four-day fast without food and water in the mountains. Well, here in the mountains, because this is Unamagi territory. We have a lot of mountains, and it's Unamagi. And uh, the time we done it here, it was in around oh, October, November. And uh, we had, with the help of the Mohawk teachers, we all gathered and we uh, exercised all these uh, teachings and the proper way to put up a teepee, the proper way to harvest poles, harvest uh, sticks and using the medicines all in together. Like when we go out the woods and we're going to prepare for, uh, to make the sweat lodge because it represents a sacred lodge, the womb represents the womb of mother. Okay, when we have tobacco and you earn tobacco or given tobacco for what you do to help people. And so when you come on to uh, all, we use alder, and sometimes we use uh, tamarack or depending. But I, I used alder at the time, and because uh, alder is a medicine, the bark is a medicine, it's very strong and it's very flexible. And then you offer tobacco and talk to them, because they are their life, and you talk to that, to the standing ones, and because um, you're going to ask permission to harvest the rest of the trees, but the one you talk to, you don't cut down. You're asking permission, and you give something back. You give tobacco back with prayer and respect. And uh, when we get enough, we get people together and get a red cloth, and we uh, will construct a sweat lodge together. Because, you know, we can't do it alone. You know, you got to have help, you know. And that's the way our culture is, you know. And uh, when we make the holes in the ground, we usually make 13 holes in the ground. Everything has a story in what represents uh, the circle hours represents uh, maybe, a, maybe a year, just like the teepee, you know. All the uh, virtues and the stories. In each hole you make, you offer tobacco and ask forgiveness or or all my relations, respect all my relations, because you are injuring Mother Earth and offer, offer tobacco, prayer to each hole, and so on. And while you're doing that, you you teach the kids, they observe. And, uh, and after you do that, we try to get everybody a uh, red cloth. We use red cloth, I'd be taught that. And each one ties pieces together, then you give ribbons to somebody else. And I tell them, each one you tie, say a prayer. Maybe you've got somebody that's sick in your family. Maybe your mom, dad, a brother. Maybe somebody has cancer, you know. But I always find people that come to our lodges will pray for somebody else. But that's, that's how our people are. They're the last. So if I have four rounds, I always have four rounds in a sweat. And I always save the last round for the individual. Because they are all busy caring people, you know. Even the, even the youth, you know, they're caring. And uh, I always save the last round for the individual. So when we uh, build a lodge, put the cover on, there's a lot of protocols, a lot of preparing, you know. You gotta get the fresh water, you gotta have the medicine like weed whistle, that's beaver root or a muskrat root, uh, fresh water. Cedar doesn't grow in Cape Breton, I don't know, and we usually get get somebody to bring it in from New Brunswick. And uh, even the grandfathers, we have to go to Parsborough. It's called Partridge Island. 
and that's Glooskap's grandmother's melting pot. There's a, that's another story. And uh, we bring the grandfathers from there, and uh, we use them in our lodge. We can get them as yellow hot, and and they're uh, you can use them over again. Some people use them over again, and uh, and uh, and the bundles, our pipe, our rattle, our drums. Uh, there's so much, and the reason I say ours because all these things that I fasted for maybe three days, maybe four days, the, our, our pipe, our rattle, or our medicines, they don't belong to me. They belong to all of us because that's our culture. We're supposed to share our medicines. And I have no ownership of them. You know. They're ours, and they're ours to uh, use. Project with the youth, uh, we had teepees given to every reserve. And my role was to go on the reserves and, uh, and usually the leader of the, of the Red Road Project group, they would have a leader. And, uh, and they would represent the other youth. And there'd be one in each reserve. And when you teach them how to put up the teepee, because they have one in their communities. I had the uh, pleasure of going up to each reserve and maybe spend the night and because uh, you know Lorianne probably arranged a, a place for me to stay and have my meals. Oh but it was fun you know and to meet people all the time like it was never a stranger when you come to a community. You never feel a stranger because you know they're ill new or you know a red man like me you know and meet the kids. You know, as a, as a member of the community there, you know, I, was, uh, I, I received my name when I went to, uh, when I earned our uh, lodge, when I earned our sacred fire, and I still have them teaching, so it's, I'm getting of an age now that I got to pass it on. I got to pass it on to somebody, and I know a lot of youth, but they'd have to do the same as I do. They could take a four day fast have to have a sweat to earn their bundle. And of course, you know, I you receive gifts all the time when you do this type of work, you know. And, uh, you know, you save some. After a while, your bundle grows. You go somewhere and do something uh, for someone to help them, and you might get tobacco, you might get sage, you might get a little item. You know, I have some things here I got over the years. They're little gifts. But, you know, I always say, hey, I don't own them. They, they belong to all of us. I pass them on. Uh, the kids they have, would have a talking circle, and, uh, and you know, like we have a uh, something coming up in um, Orangedale there in July. And last year we had it one there, and uh, we've been to Bear, the Bear River, with Frank Muse. And when we go out there in in that area, the kids. We tell the kids not to bring any uh, electronics or anything, anything like that, and no junk food. So, and there's no electricity out there, maybe except for uh, emergency. And uh, we have tech, we have camps like teepees, and we have some lodges there, and a few cabins. And uh, it's very well prepared by uh, Frank Muse in that area. Last few years we haven't been out there, but uh, Frank is a very good, very good um, provider and uh, storyteller and uh, awesome person. And, uh, he ha always has a story. You know, when they came up there and told, we were told that nobody's allowed electronics. And I think he had some of the local boys, and they had uh, somebody carve a phone. And leave it at the doorway. Well, not just the doorway. It's just a bunch of trees, and I said, just pretend to call one, just in case you have a withdrawal. Or <laughs> he's a he's an awesome person. But I miss that area, you know, because I used to go there a few years with the kids, and it's I think it's about six or seven years now we've been doing it. And, uh, the last trip I had was uh, just last month. But I got sick there. I, I had a bowel obstruction. I mean, that happened about oh, three and a half years ago. But that happens. You know, you get, you get sick. 
So I ended up in the hospital over there, and that's where I left Jordy and Pat. <laughs> I couldn't do a sweat that night. <laughs> we just came from Parsboro with uh, with Gerald Glaude. He's, he's a geologist. They, oh, he's an awesome person, you know, good teacher. And I've known Gerald for quite a few years. And, uh, he's, he tells us a story in the history of the area, you know, where, where the dinosaur bones can be found and, uh, and gemstones. And, while we were there, the kids had found some amethyst and, you know, a very interesting person. And, and he knows of, he knows of a lot of people that in that area that were like, uh, Eldon George, he's a geologist and he, uh, he had worked with him and for years. And that's a historic, historic place. And, uh, the kids. They're just awesome. Everyone has has a gift and a story. I know when you listen to them in a, you know, in the, in the teepee, we used to have our talking circles, our opening opening prayers, daily. It, this has had to be it had to be daily, you know, before breakfast, early in the morning, before breakfast, they'd have a talking circle, just check up, see how everybody's doing, and you know, keep in contact and keep in touch. And uh, and sometimes there's you know kids are so gifted and somebody would bring a drum maybe somebody has a story to tell or somebody has a a song to sing or a, you know a story to tell you know and it's not just I'm not just there as an elder but I, as an observer I learn so much from the kids too it's by their behavior and of course we Frank would probably invite somebody in. That specializes in making canoes and in the history, like Todd Labrador from that area. Oh, what an awesome teacher he is! Too, you know, he'll bring the canoe, and I think he has some in the museum. He has a couple. Has I know he has one canoe there in the, in one of the museums there, and uh, and he does other things too. You know, like he would make little baskets and so on with uh, pine pitch and uh, and uh, the root and. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I knew his father, you know, way back when, and, and the philosophies of his father, you know, they still remain with us today. And, uh, he was really in touch with nature. And there was another gentleman that brought in how to make fire with just, with friction or flint, and making tea, making bannock and cooking bannock, or, you know, making it on the spot. And, Teachers like that, and then we have uh, another gentleman by one of Frank's brothers there, Dusty. He would make, he brought, uh, teach us how to make flowers out of the wood, the wooden flowers, and, you know, and, and basket making. Somebody would come in, teach us how to make basket making, and a uh, few of the elders down that way, like Gold River and areas like that, we had, uh, gee. Mrs. Morris come in. We used to have another old fellow that came in, but uh, he passed on. But, you know, uh, just so many, so many teachings. And the youth, they're game for anything, you know. You know they challenge their fears. And of course, I would run a sweat too. So uh, usually, if we have something going on, I would conduct a sweat and have the kids help me put it together. If it's not all together, you know, the kids already know what to do if they've been there the second or third year. You know, as an addiction counselor here for the last uh, for the last few years, you know, I, I find that kids are more comfortable with each other. You know, growing up on, on an outside community for years, I felt so there was no uh, no guidance counselors and nobody to really understand what Indigenous people think, you know, uh, because we're... Uh, being so unique now, when when Aboriginal people and youth get together, they they like to do things together, you know. And uh, when you go out and get your first first hunt and first harvest, you know you're recognized by the community as doing something that you're supposed to do, and you're you know you're appreciated and you're honored. We got to get back some of them teachings, you know. I, I know uh, right now we haven't done too much of that. 
listening to the elders sometimes, the first time when they were born, their, their mother took them and put their head on Mother Earth. This is, this is your true mother, you know, and the connection. Teach them back that you're connected to Mother Earth because she gives us so much, you know, so much of the teaching, so much of the life. And um, seeing kids today, like uh, going back to uh, going to school and doing things together, I find that it's growing. Even the powwow, when you go to powwows here, like I remember when they had the first powwow, there was a few kids there, you know, and, that. and the kids are more Western as they were teasing them, making fun. Now or today, we're a little more uh, thick-skinned, you know, and uh, and I see more kids today that appreciate who they are and their culture. I've seen little kids just smile, going up there with their little fan, and, and uh, you know, uh, it's awesome, awesome feeling to see that because, you know, I, I carry a staff at the powwow for years, you know. And, uh, I've seen a lot of, lot of growth, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of hope. When I get to college there, I see a lot of kids and I listen to them and I see more, more, uh, more on the computer. And there's uh, more involvement. You know, I have my, my youngest son. He just got back from uh, Dartmouth College in Vermont, I think, and, and he came first prize. And, he, and they go all the time, you know, compete. Oh, they only came second or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, it, he's, at least he's doing something challenging, challenging himself. You got really nobody else to challenge, you know. You know, he could... Um, he could be out with the other group of friends that when he was doing that, he wasn't doing anything but drinking. They're all, they're all have a few beer and, you know, uh, I see you just going out. You're out of America around, eh? You're not getting anywhere. But when they're doing this, they're outgoing. Like, you know, I don't know how he ever does it sometime. He comes to the house and he'll say, hey, I'm going out to uh, this here place, Dartmouth College, or, or they'll go to New Mexico or something. Geez, how is he doing it? He's got friends. They got connections, and in today's technology, all they got is a phone. Eh? You know, and they'll talk, talk to somebody over there in a few minutes. Oh, we're going to New Hampshire, uh, just like that. You know, they come a long way from smoke signals. Like, you know, it's uh, modern tech. Holy God, it's uh, it's fast. You know, and it comes back like, oh, uh, who are you going with? You know. Say, oh, he'll call somebody in Red Bank, one of his friends in Red Bank, or uh, Ty, or, uh, or Michael R. Denny. He'll call him, when are we leaving? When are we going? He pick me. You know, everything is so instant, and everything is so prepared, even if you're not prepared. And he'll say, oh, you know, he'll come to the house, and he'll, he doesn't have a washer at home. He comes to the house to eat, and once in a while, maybe to sleep, you know. And... You know, I don't think he buys any groceries, uh, so he comes over every day and say, "I gotta go," you know. But kids like him, I'm not the only one that has a kid like that. I think every community has their kid like that that's outgoing, you know, and ready to challenge life. You know, because because they, they look at notice that Western life is really hasn't doesn't have that much to offer as far as uh, our culture. This is our culture. Dance, song, storytelling, field trips, harvesting, adventures, you know. This is, this is our, our life, you know. I'm sure everybody else has life. No, I'm not, not disregarding, you know, not dishonoring anybody else, you know, or anybody else's culture. They too have drums. The black man has a drum. The white man has a drum. The Irish, you know, and uh, the yellow man, you know. We all have drums. We're all connected. Sometimes people ask, you know, to, uh, you know, we got to remember, you know, they're all introduced, and we can we can connect and say, you know, you, you too have a drum, you know. You're you're connected to the drum beat, and you're in your mom's womb, whether you're black, white, red, or yellow. And today, now we have mixed marriages and so on. We have rainbow warriors out there, just like that ribbon on the table there. It's our children today. But they're still our little warriors. 
And you do carry out our messages and our stories and our drums, our dancing and our language. And language is pretty important too. We carry uh, the seven sacred teachings already, you know, to, to be properly, uh, you know, like the four directions, like I told you about the teepee and the directions, the pole, the virtues, you know, these things. And, uh, you know, we have, we have elders and we have uh, educators and teachers in the college that, you know, compare the teachings of our elders. You know, a lot of this, a lot of what we do is already uh, similar to what uh, Western science has offered. Because, you know, like uh, uh, Albert and Merdina, they, they uh, introduced two I'd seen program with uh, Professor Sarah Bartlett at CBU. You know, they take the best of Western knowledge and the best of uh, uh, from the uh, elders and put it together. I think something like that would be important. So, you know, because we speak English today, and that's uh, that's the voice we have to hold on to, to you know. But Mi'kmaq too. Is our language here, but we can. There's other languages that we speak too, like like French too. You know, a lot of our words are French. And, uh, kids today, they can. Uh, I, I I remember one fellow that would graduated uh, Maxwell. Oh my God, he's, he's learning Chinese. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I never asked him, but that's him. Eh? You know, I said, Holy God, this is a challenge for him. I guess you know. Because he's ready to study in and a uh, challenge for him. Each individual challenge, I guess. I think it's up to us, you know, I said, hey, to encourage it also, you know. We encourage more teachings. To learn to listen and listen to learn, and, you know. I think it uh, teaches, teaches the youth to be proud of who they are. They too are very important in our culture. They're the next future generations of our, you know, of our youths, our future youths, and future youths, the next group coming. Because you know they have a leader, and you know, before you know it, they're too old to stay in it, and somebody else comes in. And it's time for him to move on, him or her, and to be an educator, go to school, books, you know, go to college, be an educator again. You know, it's just part of growing. It's growth. A stepping stone, not a stumbling block, a stepping stone. It's just a matter of how you view it. You know, I enjoy the youth. I enjoy telling stories, you know. I, I like to tell stories sometimes. Like, uh, and kids, they're my, they're, they have so much, they're so, they're so, uh, they're so honest with questions sometimes. Sometimes they give you, a, they'll give you a question that'll stop you, you know. I have my, Grandson is autistic. Like, I was told that he would never walk, he would never see, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, over time, when I uh, seen him staggering when he was about, oh, almost two, I remembered uh, my niece down the road here, she did the same, and she had tubes put in her ear, and I told my daughter, my daughter had adopted him, because, you know, uh, the doctor told us, hey, we're getting of age, we shouldn't have to look after her kids. I said, I don't care. He's uh, one of he's one of my you know my grandchildren, and when he had that fixed, he you know he comes over every day and he's he's running and he's hyper. Once he started walking straight or running straight, he never stopped. So he's at my house every day. He's got homeschooling now, and uh, and right now he uh, I take him for a ride every Sunday. We'll go out maybe to flea market. We'll go fishing, you know, or go out the woods. Or we'll, get, we'll gather sticks or gather grandfathers, you know. I'm still teaching him this. And when he was going to the school over here, uh, over the hill here, uh, Shipyard Elementary, the teacher was saying that, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's already uh, sharing some of the things because he comes with me to conferences or workshops. He was teaching the kids about the smudging, 
that you know in the class. So, you know, but uh, because he's autistic, we had to pull him out. And um, so he's still, he learned so much, you know, even with the technology, you know, he's telling me about the astrology, you know, and the planets. And, you know, he doesn't read a book. He doesn't read any books because it's right there in that little, you know, and uh, he can't, he can't write very well, but he has homeschooling. But as far as, this, you know, I had, uh, he has this technology and uh, I'm surprised that, you know, all this, uh, he knows about the planets, the light of years and so on, you know. And I said, oh my God, that's amazing. And then don't even kid it. <laughs> but he'll ask you questions and. Sometime when I see him watching TV and the cartoons there, you know, I said, they're educational. They're really educational because sometimes, oh, it's only cartoon, and then, you know, but I'm old school, right? I didn't take time to stop and listen just because it's a cartoon. <laughs> but other than that, I think that was, uh, that's important to talk about too, is how children are uh, getting their education too. And I think a lot, a lot of our own people can do this. Oh, yeah, I got to share one other thing too. Now we're going to uh, this here uh, Red Road Project School. We had different youth, and uh, I see one youth. He's artistic and he's able to uh, can't keep still, can't sit still. Owls hyper. And uh, over time, there, gee, I see him at, uh, but he loves music. Jeez, I see him perform now, and he's a rap, and he can, he, oh, he's awesome. So he, he, it wasn't a disadvantage of being autistic, it was an advantage, and, you know. He made use of the disadvantage, it's supposed to be, but it wasn't, it was a gift. And, you know, he's happy with what he does.